Okay, we might um, get started on the dot, 12.30. So I'd like to welcome all the participants and good morning and good afternoon to all. We have got um, a huge number of participants, which is really, really exciting and, and pleasing to see. So the day's um, topic is getting your head around psychometric assessments. And before we start and I introduce you to my um, guest speaker, I just want to introduce myself as Susan Pincus. I'm the careers professional with the College of Law. And very briefly, my background is that um, prior to joining the college, I worked uh, with one of the universities in their law school, working mainly with law graduates and getting them ready for employability and transferring um, into their, their future careers. And prior to that, I worked in recruitment and as a generalist HR manager and I had a lot of exposure to using psychometric assessments there as part of the recruitment process. And that was not only for graduates, it was also for professionals and for managers. So I'll be drawing upon that experience today. I'd like to introduce you to Trent Shorten, who has very kindly agreed to come and um, share the session with me. Trent is a HR consultant uh, of graduate programs with Ashurst. And as you probably already know, Ashurst is a, a global firm with uh, diverse practice areas across a range of, of industries. And Trent looks after both clerkship and graduate recruitment and the respective programs for the Melbourne office. And um, you know, Trent, if you just wanna say hi and introduce yourself briefly yeah of course uh, thanks susan um first of all thanks so much for having me today and hi to everyone out there thanks so much for coming um yeah as susan mentioned my name's trent shorten so i am the hr consultant for grad programs at ashurst um i basically manage the entire process for the melbourne office um so all the way from i guess doing things like this and sort of the marketing side of, of clerk recruitment and grad recruitment um all the way up until the grads eventually settle um as being lawyers and sort of everything in between that so including clerk recruitment um running the clerkships uh eventually getting the grads in and then running the the grad programs as well for the Melbourne office. Um, I've been in the law industry for about three years now. So I've just recently come back from London um, where I was dealing with grad programs over there for another global law firm. Um, and then previous to that, uh, my previous four years, I've, I've spent HR as well. So similar to Susan, I've spent a lot of time around psychometric assessments um, and have seen, I guess, a few varied assessments. And, and I guess they each have their own merit as to what they're being used for. Um, but yeah, looking forward to going through how Ashurst uses um, their psychometric tests today. So thank you. Thanks for that, Trent. Um, I also just wanted to qualify that Trent and myself are not psychologists. So we are not here to go into kind of intricate details about um, validity and reliability statistics and data measurement. Um, but we can say that the assessments that we've been used are of course uh, statistically and reliably valid. Um, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. If we can just leave questions to the end of the session, that would be fantastic. And if we do by any chance run out and we get just so many questions that we can't get through to them, don't worry, um, they'll be sent um, to me and we will email our responses back to you at the end of the session. So I'm gonna just start off and do a little bit of an introduction on psychometric assessments in general, and then I'm gonna um, pass over to Trent, who's going to talk specifically about the Ashurst experience with, with assessments. So we're going to cover um, when and why assessments are used, the type of assessments that are typically used. We're gonna look at some sample questions and also, um, whether you can actually prepare and what um, some of the ideas might be around that. And also um, even, you know, some of the questions like around whether you can fake your answers as well. So in terms of the actual definition of a psychometric assessment, 
Um, there's a few things here which are really, really important. The fact that it is a, a standard and scientific method. So as, as mentioned before, these tests have been, um, they've been tested and that they are statistically reliable and, and um, valid. And there's a number of things that go behind that. So that is all um, very intricate and involved and we won't be, of course, going into the detail there. But they look at a candidate's suitability for a role and it's based on the personality characteristics um, as well as the aptitude or cognitive abilities. So cognitive abilities is the same as aptitudes um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those um, cognitive abilities and aptitudes include. So in terms of when assessments are actually used, that is going to vary across different organisations. So there's no fast um, rule there. The law firms on the whole have been more traditional in their approach to psychometric assessments. And we'll talk a little bit more about the types of tools that they're using as well. But in terms of the recruitment process and when assessments come into play, it would typically be um, starting off with your online application form, which would be your, your CV, your cover letter, your academic transcript, um, key selection criteria in some cases, not, not all cases, but you, you will get um, KSC, particularly with government roles, um, and also some, some short questions as well. Um, so, in terms of those those short questions um, within the the legal profession, just a, a couple of those might be something along the lines: What global experience and skills do you have, which would help you thrive? Or there might be: Which business news story has interested you the most, and and why? Or what do you think law firms um, can do differently in order to stay relevant in this dynamic and, and changing environment? So you might be asked some behavioural questions as well as questions like that too. Um, then we have the psychometric assessment. Some firms do phone interviews, um, virtual interviews. Um, then we might even have an assessment centre where you're called in and you are um, put through a number of different tasks and you're, um, you're observed by psychologists or by people within the, the people and culture team. And then there might be one interview or even two interviews where you'll meet, um, you'll meet partners, you'll, you'll meet other lawyers, you'll meet um, people within the PNC. So that, um, just to, to point out there that the programs can be within the big corporates that they might follow that and also within some of the, the, the government departments. So it's important to know that not all mid-tier and top-tier firms use psych assessments um, and they tend to be more standard recruitment process and then they'll also introduce things like cocktail evenings, they might do breakfast and lunch presentations um, where they're obviously um, getting to know you and meeting you and observing your, your behaviour at the same time. So why are they actually used? Um, they're used um, because they're seen as being scientific, standardised and fair. They take away the unconscious bias that sometimes can come into the recruitment process. So there's um, a whole lot of other things like that, the halo effect or... I mean, it can be a number of things where perhaps um, the recruitment panel could form a, a bias um, for a person or against an individual. So this takes out that from the process. Um, it also helps provide objective information where you can compare candidates. And it can also allow you to pick up information on candidates that are otherwise quite difficult to assess during the recruitment process. So these are things like uh, motivations, EQ, values and interests. 
The other thing is that um, it can also reduce recruitment time, um, given that there are a huge volume of applications for kind of clerkships and, and traineeships. It can just um, streamline um, a very, very exhaustive and extensive process as well. Now going to just talk very briefly about the types of psychometric assessments that are used um, overall. Um, we have what we call the aptitude or the ability or cognitive tests, um, and they measure your general cognitive abilities. Um, these include typically your verbal reasoning, your numerical reasoning and your abstract reasoning. And when we look at your, your verbal reasoning, the questions there that you're likely to be get would be around um, grammar, it can be around um, vocabulary and reading comprehension. Numerical reasoning, uh, it can range from simple arithmetic to complex numeric reasoning, questions that are provided in kind of blocks of information that you need to interpret. And abstract reasoning, which is kind of probably one of my, my, um, my favourite ones, um, is where you look at a sequence of symbols and shapes and you determine how to complete the series. Um, the other tests, spatial reasoning and mechanical reasoning, are less commonly used um, specifically for, for law students. They might be used for um, more engineering and very, very kind of technical roles where those are obviously required. When you're, you're doing these aptitude and ability tests, there are right and wrong answers. So that's really, really important to know. And I think kind of it's, it's important that you work through these questions really, really quickly, um, obviously avoiding wild guessing, but it's important that you work, work through them because you can get caught up on them and you can lose time very, very quickly. So important just to know that. The other type of assessments um, are personality and behavioural questionnaires. So these aren't tests as such because there, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, it, it's a self-report, so it can only ever be as, um, as open and honest as you are when you're completing it. So there are, um, there are inbuilt scales in these assessments that do determine whether you are trying to fake it or whether you are perhaps um, trying to conjure up an image that the employer might, um, we think they might be wanting, but in actual fact, it might not be the case. So it will throw out your um, validity scores if you do try and kind of fake it. Um, so in terms of these types of questionnaires, these will typically um, be a most like me, least like me. They look at a range of behaviours in the workplace. They look at how you would fit into the organisation and the culture and a range of competencies as well and traits. And as mentioned before, um, no, no um, reason why you wouldn't answer those questions. Just almost like kind of with your gut instinct um, without overanalyzing. Um, otherwise, you get into a bit of analysis paralysis there. Um, very briefly, how are they scored? I think kind of the important thing to mention here, and Trent will um, talk about that as well, is that um, it is very short-sighted if an organisation was going to be making an assessment on an individual based on their psychometric assessment um, only. It's a little bit like academic results as well. So the, um, the thing to remember here is that firms are looking at the individual as a, as a, total, um, a total being. Um, they're looking at you in terms of your, your work experience. Have you picked up some legal um, internships or legal placements? Do you do voluntary work? Are you involved at university in extracurricular activities, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the aptitude results um, and, the, and the behavioral questionnaires are only part of it. Um, but saying that these tests are measured against a norm group um, which might be a graduate norm group or a, a manager professional norm group or even norms from um, 
the organisation. So I think Ashurst, um, from Trent, I think you mentioned that they they look at their own norms in terms of um, clerks and, and graduates. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the other thing is um, what this does is it gives you, the, the aptitude and ability tests give you a percentile, which is basically where you fit in within that group. So if you were to get a 95 percentile on your verbal reasoning, it would mean that you are in the top five percentile of that norm group. And with the personality questions, questionnaires, as mentioned, um, they would be looked at against um, some of the preferred behaviours of, of um, people that have perhaps um, performed really, really well within that organisation. Um, they're just some practice tests that I've included um, and Trent's going to talk a little bit more about how you can prepare. But if you want to just run through some of those, um, it can just take away the, the surprise factor. And that's just me. So I am now going to pass you over to Trent. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, just bear with me a second, guys. I'm just going to get my screen up here. Hey, can I just get you to confirm, Susan, that you can see those slides yeah. there? Yep, that's great. Perfect. No worries. Cool. Okay, guys. Um, as I mentioned, uh, well, as Susan alluded to, I'll be going through um, psychometric testing at Ashurst. Um, I'll be going through the content that you can see on your slides here. So psychometric testing at Ashurst. So where do we use it and what tests do we use? Um, I'll be going through what competencies we're looking for within these tests. Uh, I'll also show you some sample tests. Um, we'll go through some questions. Um, I'll sh show you the sample games and things like that that we use um, specific to Ashurst. Um, a lot of the, the tests and the questions are very similar and most, um, I guess, come from the same bank, which is always handy as well. So it does help to do other tests, um, that, which I will go into as well with the fourth point, um, which is how to prepare. So I'll be able to give you some tips on how to prepare um, and the best way to approach the tests as well. Okay, uh, so Ashurst uses a provider called Revelion, um, basically to undertake our psych psychometric testing, um, of which has basically been developed over a number of years. Um, it's not that we've just sort of implemented it after one year, it takes years to develop um, these sorts of tests and also to tailor it to certain um, firms or organisations as well. So our psychometric testing um, is undertaken after the application phase. So you saw Susan um, bring up the, I guess, the different phases of, of the um, applications and ours comes straight after the application phase before you would be invited to a face-to-face -face interview. So we've used the testing at Ashurst for about four years now um, and align it to our performance appraisals once you're working at Ashurst as well. So um, obviously we've started with our clerks um, four years ago. So we're now actually seeing um, the workplace outcomes from the testing that we did then in our graduates that are coming through now um, in order to, yeah, I guess validate what we're doing um, and making sure it's working as well. So using the psychometric testing, we're looking at the, um, to test three different aspects at Ashurst, um, including a, gen a candidate's general cognitive and problem solving ability, um, work related values, and also emotional intelligence as well. So we'll go over each of these individually, um, showing you the competencies we're looking for and basically how we test each aspect. And as I said, I'll show you the games and things like that that we use as well. Okay, so the first one is cognitive ability. So first thing is to define cognitive ability. So uh, we're looking for an individual's ability to acquire, organise, recall and apply information within the cognitive ability tests, um, of which I'm sure you can all agree that all of these things um, very much apply to being a lawyer um, and dealing with lots and lots of information and also complex information as well. 
So what are the abilities of behavior shown by those with high cognitive ability? Um, so we've outlined um, five different things. The first one is meeting moving deadlines. Um, obviously deadlines happen all the time within this industry, whether that may be sort of dealing with your own team and deadlines um, changing within there or external client demands, so very important. The second one is adjusting to organizational change. Um, so basically this is, um, changes not only internally, but also externally with your clients as well, um, or changes that might happen throughout a deal or a piece of work you're working on, um, and how you're how quickly you're able to adjust um, to that new information um, and, and use your skills to make sure you're getting the best outcome out of that. The third one is um, presenting and reporting using data. Um, so presenting to clients, presenting internally, um, whether it may be training um, and also external, similar to what I'm doing at the moment. Um, and basically getting the amount of information um, and basically bringing it across in a nice and concise way um, and a very productive way for our clients as well. So the fourth one is finding a solution to an unforeseen challenge. Um, so Obviously, most of the time, clients aren't coming to us with uh, easy legal questions. Um, nowadays, most um, companies or most of our clients will have in-house lawyers as well. Um, so when they are coming to us with problems, they're often problems that we've never seen before or that the world has never seen before. Um, so we need people that are able to, um, I guess, solve unfamiliar problems that have never been touched um, before, whether that might be um, within the space or, yeah, in the world in general. Um, and then five, starting a different role at the same organisation. Um, so this probably applies more to um, rising up through the ranks. So for instance, in Ashurst, um, if you were to start as a clerk and then hopefully eventually make it to council or partner, um, basically uh, learning and applying new skills throughout that, um, knowing when to rely on your previous skills. So what you've learnt maybe um, from being an associate or um, a grad from when you're becoming a senior associate and then identifying what new experiences you need to learn um, and use within that as well. Okay, so how do we test this? Um, we use it through a test called Cognify, um, which is provided by Revelion, as I mentioned. So we're assessing three attributes within this test, um, which Susan alluded to before. So the first one is problem solving, the second one is numerical reasoning, and then the third one is verbal knowledge. So the results of these tests will determine how candidates perform on the job. There's no questions or such in this test. Um, we actually use six mini games, uh, which I'll show you in a second. There are questions in the tests, um, but I guess it's not like a multiple choice or, or anything like that. The tests are gamified. So the games will take you approximately 30 minutes um, within Cognify, and there are tutorials for you to go through um, before you jump into each of them. Uh, I'd obviously highly recommend that you do these a few times. You can do them as many times as you like. Um, and yeah, I would highly recommend you guys to do this as many times as you can before you get comfortable before ac actually tackling the real thing. Um, as I said, do it as many times as you like. It's, in, it's interesting, yeah. so it's actually kind of also the fact that it's in the game format means that it's, a, it's maybe a little bit more fun as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess for those that sort of love playing Candy Crush and all those sorts of things, yeah. um, I guess it is, is similar to those sorts of things, um, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later, but it also helps to, I guess, do them over and over again, just to even get familiar with the games. Um, if you're not, I guess, used to dealing with sort of app-based games and things like that with sort of things flying everywhere um, to sort of brush up on those things as well, which I'll go into a little bit later. But yeah, correct. Thank you. Um, so the business outcomes that are proven by those who do well in these tests um, include better job performance, increased productivity, um, shorter onboarding times, reduced involuntary turnover, um, and also improved training outcomes as well. So I'm sure the biggest question at the moment is, is what are the games and what do they look like? So the first one I mentioned is problem solving. Um, problem solving measures a candidate's ability to solve new problems without prior knowledge. Um, so this includes your ability to learn, work under time pressures, evaluate and understand information, especially when it comes to new information, as I mentioned before. Um, being able to be flexible and adapt and switch between tasks when they come up last minute, um, and also to focus your attention and also recover from errors, um, which is a, a big thing that I'll sort of mention throughout the games as well. 
So you can see the highlighted games under problem solving um, underneath the overall score. So I'll now go through each of those um, and just show you what the games entail. Okay, so the three game based tests um, are used here. So the first one is shortcuts. We then have gridlock in the middle and then resemble on the right hand side. So I'll go through each of them in turn. So the first one, uh, shortcuts, is basically a maze game. So the aim, um, and I'm hoping this is sort of showing up on your screens well enough. So the aim is to collect the stars on the right hand side using the blue marble, which you can see on the left hand side of that screenshot. Um, it's a timed game. The limit for the is forty is four minutes. Sorry, um, and basically you will be given an obstacle. So the red marbles are your obstacles. You're able to move those, um, and it may not come up well enough on your screen, but you can sort of see um, some numbers in between the different paths you have to use, and it's basically about choosing the quickest path. So. Um, there might be a number two or a number three, um, and then basically working out which way um, is best to reach those stars in the shortest amount possible. You are able to get real-time feedback on this. Um, if you look on the very bottom uh, of the screenshot, you can actually see a bar going along there, and I'll actually show you how you're doing with each um, with each puzzle or each challenge or each game, um, which is what I mentioned before about recovering from errors. So if you sort of do the first or the second one and it might sort of be getting below or maybe mid um, how you're working these puzzles out, you may be able to work out while you're going through the games um, how well you're doing and improve that over time when you're doing the games. Um, so that's why I sort of made a point of pointing out the recovering from errors and sort of learning from mistakes, you can actually do this within the games as well. And that's the, that's the reasoning behind giving you this real-time feedback. Okay, so the second one along is Gridlock. Uh, so Gridlock looks very similar to Tetris. Uh, is a game where you will use blocks to fill in the grid as quick as you can uh, with the different shapes. So each of the shapes um, you can see there will rotate, so you can manipulate them to fit within the grid. There'll be nine puzzles in total, um, which will increase in complexity as you go. Um, and this will take three minutes to complete. Uh, the grid won't always look like that. It may change around and may have gaps and things like that in it. Um, so that will increase, as I said, as the, the complexity goes along. The third one, uh, resemble. So this test will give you a pattern on the left-hand side, which you can see there, which is complete. Um, and then you'll need to replicate this on the right-hand side with the pieces given to you. So you can rotate the pieces to achieve this. Um, there are nine puzzles to complete in this one, again, increasing with complexity. Um, and to throw a spanner in the works with this one, on the left-hand side, it's not always um, what it seems. So it may give you the, the picture as it's shown there, but it may actually tell you to rotate at say 90 degrees or 180 degrees. So you've got to deal with that um, new information and sort of manipulating it around in that sense as well. Want to note with all three of these games, um, there's a strict time limit with all of them. So no matter how far you get um, in each level, it will still cut off at the, um, the time. So shortcuts will be four minutes and the other two will be three minutes. The important thing to remember is the games aren't designed to be finished. So um, don't get down on yourself if you're not getting right to the end um, or anything like that. It very much is about um, how you are solving these as well as much as it is um, about time pressures as well. Um, so just making sure you're finding a right balance with that. And as Susan mentioned, not sort of making wild guesses. Um, try to make educated guesses while you're under the time pressure as well. Um, and again, don't freak out. The, I think the games um, are pretty much impossible to make it to the end of. I think maybe the top 1% of people can get to the top of it, get to the end of the game. So mm -hmm. don't be too hard on yourself. It's good to know. <laughs> Okay, so the second one, uh, Ability and Cognify is Numerical Reasoning, uh, which has two base game tests. So Numerical Reasoning measures how well a candidate comprehends quantitative and numerical concepts, which includes their ability to learn, um, solve problems under pressure, evaluate and consider information, again, also including new information as well, um, be able to think flexible, adapt and change and switch between tasks, maintain focus, and again, um, making a point of it recovering from errors and mistakes. So again, 
just down the bottom right-hand side, I've just highlighted the two games that we use for numerical reasoning. Uh, so I'll show you what these two involve. Okay, so the two games we use in numerical reasoning are num bubbles and tally up. Uh, num bubbles, other than having a, a fantastic name in my opinion, um, is a game where you'll basically have floating bubbles flying around on your screen, um, each with its own equation within it. And the objective is to pop the bubbles with the formula that are matching the numbers shown at the bottom of the screen. So if you can see the screenshot there, there's um, a white box which contains the number 12. And then what you need to do is click on the balloons to pop um, whichever ones equate to the number 12. Um, each uh, round is 20 seconds. So that 12 will sit there for 20 seconds and different um, balloons or bubbles will be floating around um, and come up over that 20 seconds. And there'll be 10 different rounds. So there'll be 10 different um, numbers or equations as you go along. And as per the other games, the, the complexity will increase as well. The second one, Tally Up, um, which looks similar to Num Bubbles, is a game um, which will give you two different sides, so left and right, with a set of numbers in each box. Um, you basically need to determine which side has the highest value or whether it may be equal as well. So there's an equal sign um, in between the left and right. So it's quite possible that the, the, um, the equations might be equal as well. So you've got sort of three factors to put in. Um, the game has 35 rounds of varying complexity, uh, so there'd be 35 different equations you have to do. The first one there is probably um, one of the most simple ones, so it's more addition. As it gets more complex, um, you'll actually start getting sort of times and divides and things like that in there. Um, again, it is, I guess, somewhat impossible to get to the end of these things. Um, as I said, the top 1%. So um, just do the best you can with these um, in getting to the end and sort of take your time with each. Okay, and the final one for Cognify is verbal knowledge. Um, so verbal knowledge measures the candidate's breadth of knowledge and ability regarding written language. So this includes reading and writing skills, uh, your attention to detail, especially under time pressures, um, being able to extract meaning from text and getting to the point, and also working efficiently and again, recovering from mistakes as well. So there's only one game for verbal knowledge, uh, which is called Proof It. Uh, this is an attention to detail based game and is basically looking at misspelled words, grammatical and punctual errors um, within a set of information that is given to you. So there's five rounds of five documents that you will go through. Um, you'll have five minutes to complete uh, the entirety of it. So basically one minute for each document. Um, you will see in the screenshot there the, the errors on the left-hand side um, in terms of, for instance, the mistakes, there's a double A there. On the right-hand side, there's a number four. That is actually um, the number of mistakes that you will be needed to find within that set of information. So you'll get a sense of how many are in there and what you're looking for. Um, Again, just make sure you're going through um, sort of at your own pace within the timeframes um, and sort of not rushing through. You can click on wrong things as well. So you can't just go through the whole thing and start clicking everywhere in the hope that you might get, um, say, all four within that. Um, it'll also take into account any wrong um, or any right things that you are clicking as well. Okay, so moving on to emotional intelligence. So this is a second ability we're testing. Um, traditionally, employees were required to hide their emotions. Um, now research is showing that organisations acknowledge that mo emotions are actually useful. Um, it is about expressing them constructively in a beneficial manager. Who'd have thought it? Um, so emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive emotions, use emotions to facilitate cognitive processes, um, and also understand emotions and manage them. So both within yourself and other people as well. Um, so what are the abilities of those with high emotional intelligence? So the workplace behaviours um, of those with high emotional intelligence um, include easily forming relationships with people, so both clients and colleagues within a law setting, um, demonstrate effective leadership skills, for example, identifying others' emotions um, and using this as a tool to better engage them. Third one, influencing stakeholders, so identifying others' emotions and adjusting your approach to suit. Um, for instance, maybe not asking your boss uh, for time off when they might be in a bad mood or something like that, um, or, or asking for clients for things when they might be, might be down. 
Um, fourth, responding to uh, change or stressful events. So identifying your own emotions for one. Uh, then also putting yourself in other people's shoes and thinking about the bigger picture and the best way forward um, based on the emotions that you've identified within yourself and how other people might be feeling as well. And the fifth one, um, adopting an approach in the moment. So um, it may not all, like, you may not always have time to identify these things or sort of sit back and reflect. Uh, so it's also about your ability to adopt an approach in the moment. So identifying social cues, reacting mid-conversation, um, and identifying if a person's emotions were to change um, depending on the situation or conversation you have, you're having um, and responding to accordingly in, in that sense as well. Okay, so how do we test this? So we test this through a test called Emotify. Um, this is used to assess your ability to accurately identify and understand information and how to react to them. So research has shown that emotional intelligence is linked um, with important work-related outcomes such as interpersonal effectiveness, uh, the collaboration and teamwork, decision-making and success in leadership in management roles as well. So in this, uh, you will complete two mini games, uh, which are both very interactive and engaging, similar to the last uh, ones that I've shown you. They'll ask you to correctly identify um, emotions and also understand how people may feel in certain situations. So each mini game is timed um, again and takes approximately 20 minutes to complete, including the tutorials. These games um, are slightly different to the last ones that I'd shown you. Um, they do have a time limit and there is, I guess, a certain amount that you will need to get through, um, which I'll show you uh, in the games in a second. So those who do well in these tests are proven to show good leadership, communication and teamwork skills, um, all of which are very important skills for lawyers. So I'll move on and show you the games. So the first one is matching faces. So you'll see on the right hand side, you'll be asked to correctly identify um, emotions in the facial expressions based on the label. Uh, so it might be surprise, which you can see there. Um, and you will have four seconds, as you can see on the timer, to basically decide whether that is what the, um, the picture is showing or whether it is not what the picture is showing and, and matching those up. So it will uh, test your perception um, of emotion based on the people's faces um, and the faces will change um, each four seconds or each time depending if you're taking the four seconds or not when you're clicking on those um, and they'll change between sort of things like uh, the the emotions themselves but also people's gender ethnicity age um, and it'll be it'll all be completely random as well so just because you do it once um, and it's sort of giving you the one set of uh, emotions, it may not be that the second time around. So it is completely random as to what comes up. Um, important thing to note here is you'll get direct feedback from this game um, if you're right or wrong. So as soon as you hit the tick or the cross, it'll actually tell you whether you are right or wrong. Um, so again, another opportunity to sort of uh, think about your mistakes um, and be able to recover from those. So if you sort of thought that, um, one face was sort of bordering in between maybe um, happiness and, uh, oh, sorry, it's like sadness and anger. Um, you might be able to better identify that as the games go along um, and actually improve your scores that way as well. Okay, so the second one is emotional ties. Um, so in this game, there are three parts, each of which you require you to basically read an everyday situation and decide how a person would be feeling based on that situation. Um, so to do this, you're required to choose an image of a face that matches the emotion involved um, based on the scenario that is given, uh, which I'll show you in the next slide, the type of scenarios that you'll be given. Um, again, there's a diverse range of context, language, emotions, um, and things like that. In terms of the faces, they'll also change um, between gender and ethnicity. Um, and again, will be completely random as to what scenarios you will get. Um, again, you'll be given direct feedback as to how many you've got right. Um, so depending on the amount of um, different scenarios or the different amount of emotions you need to put in, it'll tell you how many you got out of three, for instance, or out of two. Um, or out of one, if it's out of one, it'll give you the amount of stars you got for those. So again, you can sort of um, try and improve over time if you were to get a couple of couple wrong. So to give you a better example, um, this is what it will look like. Um, so for example, in the first one on the left-hand side, it says that John is running late for a job interview he recently applied for. So it then asks you to give um, 
an emotion based on what you think John would be feeling there. And then it gives you a second um, part to that scenario as well. So when John arrives, he finds out the interviewer has been caught up in another meeting and is also running late. So then what would John be feeling after that? So um, I'd imagine John would be feeling fairly stressed. So he'd be looking for some sort of stressed or fearful face if he was running late for the interview. Um, and then once John arrives and realises the interview has been caught up as well, um, you'd probably be looking for some sort of relief um, or some sort of um, happy smile there to say that John is actually okay now um, and, and can get on with the interview. <laughs> So there are some of the ones in the middle one there as well. Um, it might give you one scenario and you've got to pick um, the two emotions that may come out of that. Uh, so for instance, the one in the middle is Samuel and Lucy entered into a singing competition. They both chose to perform the same song. Um, Samuel receives a standing ovation while Lucy um, is later booed off stage. So um, in that sort of situation, um, Sam has obviously received a standing ovation, so he's probably feeling pretty happy with himself. Um, but in the same scenario, uh, Lucy has been booed off stage, so she'd be probably quite upset, um, which you can see there. Uh, we've, we've chosen the sad face, and then Samuel would obviously be looking for a happy face. And then they will work along that. So there might even be um, three different scenarios as you go along, as you can see in the right-hand side one there as well. I just, I'm just going to say, Clint, someone's just yep. raised their hand. Um, yep. Just to mention that we'll come to questions just at the end of the presentation. So if you can just bear with us for a bit longer. Thank you. Yeah, sure. No worries. Thanks. Okay, and then the final aspect um, we use is a values testing. So this is related to your values as a person um, and what you consider ideal in a job um, or an organisation, um, or in this case, a firm. Um, these are the aspects that your ideal, of your ideal job that basically considered most important to you. So this test is very much about yourself as well as much as it is about us. So basically how this works is we've outlined values aligned to, or basically outlined values that Ashurst, um, both partners and staff have identified um, over the four years that we've had this in place. So this is completely ASHA specific um, and I will note that it's not a timed exercise either. So this measure, as I mentioned, is probably more as much um, for you as it is for us, is we'll basically align your values with ours um, to better identify whether we're the right fit for each other. Um, how it will work is uh, you will basically rank tw 20 key work factors um, based on importance, which I'll show you uh, the key work factors in a second, which are com basically compared with the firms that we have identified over the years um, that our, our staff and partners hold. Um, it will generally take you about 10 minutes to complete, I would say. As I said, it's not a timed thing and you, you basically do have as long as you like to do it. Um, it's my probably best recommendation that you probably don't spend too much time on it. Um, your gut instinct or your first instinct is probably the best one, um, as Susan mentioned. And it's one of those things that I'll go into later that you, you probably can't fake either. So there's probably no point um, in trying to manipulate it or try and alter yourself for it, um, which I'll go into a little bit later um, and, and sort of touch on those things as why you probably shouldn't do that as well. Um, so again, just more of a visual representation, it's the exercise is all about matching. So it can play the aspects that you consider most important and what you are looking for in, a, in an employer against Ashurst organisational values and what we can provide for you as well. So how do we test or how do we um, basically align these? So this is what the candidates will see or what you will see um, where you're required to rank the 20 statements into five sections. Um, so four items per section. So it's matched to an organisational profile. Um, so it's, there are no right or wrong answers um, and it's purely based along aligning our values. You can't really cheat, as I mentioned, um, as it would, it would be, I guess, impossible to know exactly what our values are in what order. I'm sure you could probably make an educated guess, um, but it, you've got to think about this as it's also about how well you're going to align to us as well and how happy you might be within a role with us um, based on your answers as well. So um, there's not a lot of value in you sort of trying to manipulate this um, from your perspective as well. 
Okay, so that is all the tests that we use. Um, I just wanted to touch on this as well. I know Susan mentioned this before. Um, all the assessments are, managed, are measured against our company normative data. Um, Susan mentioned before that some are measured against industry data um, and things like that, or, or maybe measured against um, certain um, pools of data that people may use depending on what they choose with their providers. Um, so we use, um, basically, we are testing you against the, the current and previous graduates that have come before, um, and you will basically be given a percentage score um, on each of the three tests. So you'll be given a percentage score and Cognify, Emotional Intelligence, and also Values. So they will sit separately, and then that will also feed into an overall suitability score as well. Um, one thing I wanted to stress with this, um, and Susan alluded to it before as well, is that there's not a cutoff mark. Um, applications are very much looked at holistically, um, and I guess the data will go along with your application. It's not an absolute cutoff mark that we look at it, and if you're not in the above average or far above average range, then um, it's a no. It's very much looked at holistically, um, and realistically, you could sit anywhere along this curve, um, but obviously informs the rest of the data we have um, about your application as well. So everything that you've put in your application, um, and also including your academic grades and things like that as well. So it will very much be a holistic approach um, and you won't just be cut off for maybe having a, a lower than average score um, on your, your psychometric testing is basically what I want to get across. Okay, so how should you prepare for all this? Um, there are some very obvious ones, um, but honestly, they're probably the most important when it comes to psychometric testing. Um, make sure you're not impacted by personal conditions. Um, so for instance, make sure you're not sick or haven't been sick um, leading up to it. Uh, make sure you your best self possible um, before you undertake it. Make sure you're comfortable, um, preferably at a desk if you can. Um, relax then you've had enough rest and exercise so that your mind is working at its best. Um, it's best to do when your mind is clear, um, when there's no other stresses around you. Um, and I find it's always good to go for an exercise or a walk just to get some fresh air, um, especially right now within the current situation when you're sort of holed up inside for most of the day. It's always good to get outside and just um, sort of free your mind before you're doing these things. So free yourself from distractions. So turn your phone off um, and get it out of sight, preferably, so you're not being distracted by this. Try to go to a separate room. Um, if you're going to be disturbed by family or friends or something like that, just try and go to a nice quiet space so they're not going to be sort of coming in and interrupting you or um, you're sort of overhearing things or anything like that from, from outside. Um, if you're wearing glasses or lenses, make sure you have them uh, nice and clean. The worst thing that can happen is that sort of your lens comes out halfway through and you've sort of got to replace it and it's, it's not good. Um, I think the, the last one, be honest. Um, perform to the best of your ability. As I mentioned, most of the games will give you real-time feedback. If you get one or two things wrong, don't get down on yourself. It's very much about how you recover as well in these psychometric tests, not just um, getting your overall score. So just make sure that if you do get one or two wrong at the start, um, I know especially with sort of emotional intelligence and things like that, it can be hard sometimes to identify what the right face looks like because some may look very similar to others. Um, but they're the sorts of things that you, you just can't get yourself down on and just make sure you're pushing on and, and sort of learning from those mistakes. Um, secondly, make sure you complete all of the example items and tutorials and the assessments themselves. Um, as I mentioned before, you can do this as many times as you like before you tackle the real thing. Um, so make sure you're well practiced before you're doing um, these exact ones. Um, I just wanted to note as well, all the tests will take about an hour to complete in the entirety, so all of the three. Um, so make sure you have enough time allocated as well um, on top of obviously ensuring that uh, you're in the right space and no one's going to distract you over that time. Okay, so can you practice? Um, so in terms of getting better at um, all of the tests, I guess probably more so um, the cognitive and emotional intelligence tests are probably the ones you're going to look to prepare for most. Um, Typically, they are very innate skills. Um, however, it helps to obviously practice the games you're undertaking to make sure you're familiar with them. Um, you'll need to 
I guess doing tests over and over will help you gain your knowledge of the types of questions that are being used. Um, not necessarily the game as such, but the type of questions or the type of formulas that people might be using. Um, many tests will use a very similar bank of questions because they're trying to test the same things. Um, so I definitely encourage you to use those links um, that Susan put up before. and I'm sure we'd be happy to share them um, after the session as well, just to make sure you're getting, I guess, a wide range of the different tests and what they're asking. Um, and again, just sort of building up your bank of questions and getting yourself in the right mind frame before doing both of these tests. Um, in terms of the um, attribute values, there's no um, right or wrong answer, so it's really hard to sort of um, practice for this, I would say. Probably doesn't hurt to get an idea of what the types of values are out there. Um, so if you wanted to look at other things um, in terms of other resources and things like that, it might not hurt to um, just have a bit of a look about what the other attributes are out there and um, there might even be lists of what certain organisations value um, just to get a sense of things. Um, but again, probably answer without too much thought or delving into too much detail and thought about it. Um, just be yourself in, in this sort of test. Okay, um, can you fake any of this? Um, with cognitive ability and emotional intelligence, because there are right or wrong answers, um, no. Um, with the attributes, again, you can fake this to a point. However, you're probably faking it more from your point of view. Um, the tests take years to develop and are very highly sophisticated. Um, so it's impossible to know what the ideal profile looks like within um, whatever firm or organisation you're going for. Um, because it very much is, um, most of the data is obviously provided by the employees of that organisation or firm, um, which it is through Ashurst. So I think the most important thing is just having consistency um, in yourself. Um, also just wanted to touch upon that final point just below um, and just say that data points might be verified um, at subsequent stages along the process as well. So um, if you do try and fake or maybe get a few friends or something to help you do the cognitive ability or emotional intelligence tests, um, we, we may test at later stages as well. So just um, be wary of that as well before you're thinking about doing that. Cool. Um, I just had those links there as well, Susan, if people wanted to copy those down quickly, but um, yep. more than happy to sort of send those out after. Um, got but, yeah. Questions. That's fantastic, Trent. Absolutely. Wow, I feel a bit exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm keen for some questions. I'm conscious that I've just spoken at yeah. people for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. um, let's get on to the questions then. I am going to start reading them. Um, okay, so someone asked what is KSC, um, key selection criteria. Um, so I just mentioned that early on. Um, so basically uh, some organisations, particularly government, will ask um, for specific responses to what the criteria is for the, um, the ability to do the job. So that um, is, is a whole process in itself. Um, oh, the, the links to various free psychometric assessments. Yep, we've done that. Um, how much weight is put on psychometric testing compared to other aspects of the application like work experience and academic results? Okay. Do, do you want to... Um... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess there's no set weighting that we use. Um, other firms might be different, I'm not sure. In terms of Ashurst, um, no, there's not particular weightings that we put on certain things. As I mentioned, it's more of a holistic approach um, and sort of matching up things as well. So sort of looking at your, your application, also looking at your grades as well. Um, and if there's any direct correlation between, say, your, your academic grades um, and the Cognify tests and things like that, it very much is a holistic approach. So there's no real weight um, one over the other. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can answer this one. Is the psychometric testing a similar process for the Hong Kong office? Oh, great question. Um, I'm honestly not too sure off the top of my head. Um, I'm thinking possibly not, but I will f I'm happy to find that out and get back to you, actually, because I'm not too sure. Yeah, that is, that's a, a bit of a tricky one, that one. Um, in terms of emotional intelligence, what are the allowances made if someone is on the autism spectrum or something similar? Oh, great question. And that actually reminds me that I forgot a part of my presentation. Um, for anybody with um, sort of special circumstances or 
um, people requiring any adjustments to be made to any of the assessments and whether that's the psychometric assessments or, or anything outside of that as well um, please make sure you contact us um, in terms of that I'll have to just double check in terms of specifics um, how we alter it or how the provider alters it with people with um, on the autistic spectrum or something similar um, so happy to to take that question and get back to you to see um, what Revellian have done in the past for those sort of situations but there's there's definitely allowances for it Okay, um, this is a question that I think is um, uh, an interesting one. So about access to previous Revellian scores. So if so, do you take those results into action or into account, sorry? Yeah, so someone's done the test before, I'm assuming. Yeah, sure. So um, if you've actually done it with Revellian, uh, they hang on to it for 12 months. If um, you are basically required to do it, do the same test again within 12 months, and this is probably more relevant um, between firms. So say if another firm was using the exact Revellian testing, um, you wouldn't have to do it over and over again if you were sort of making three or four applications. Um, in terms of looking back at scores, um, that wouldn't happen unless it's the sort of thing where you've done it for, say, X firm, and then you've come to Ashurst and you're doing the same test. Um, you, we will take the scores from that test, if that makes sense. So we won't, we won't actually get it um, if you're applying year on year, just only if you've done it within the oh, same year. Goodness. Yeah. So, okay. All right. Um, would global firms like Ashurst prefer local graduates uh, graduating from an Australian university over an overseas graduate from a common law jurisdiction, jurisdiction e.g. Hong Kong? Um, good question. Um, I guess there is no preferred. The only thing to probably flag here is that we do require people to have um, working rights within Australia. So just making sure that if you have qualified overseas, um, that you also have the working rights to work in Australia. But um, no, no preference over where you've, you've studied university, whether that's overseas or in Australia. Just as long yeah. as you've got those working rights, you'll be considered and alongside everyone else. And the global experience is something that would be highly regarded from Absolutely. My understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this question we've already answered. The testing, one hour total for everything or three hours, one hour per area? Uh, so that's an hour for all the testing. All so, that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the links again, um, that this presentation will be um, available, so you'll get the, the links. Um, if you want to redo a test, can you redo just that particular game or do you have to redo the whole section? Um, I believe you can actually redo a game. Um, and when when I say redo, this is only tutorials, so you can't have a go at one and then if you've decided you've bombed out, you, you can't go back and redo it. Um, but you can select each one of the games individually once you go into the platform um, and just do the tutorials for whichever one you'd like. Okay, okay. Um, with so many firms eliminating psychometric testing in their applications, what has motivated Ashurst to keep, to keep it on? Yeah. Good, yeah, good question. It's a very topical one. Um, <laughs> I sort of mentioned it earlier, but we've, we've been seeing, I guess, a, a big correlation between the psychometric testing that we've done in previous years. Now, um, basically having the business outcomes that we um, had hoped for with our, our current graduates coming through. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the, the graduates that are coming through now um, in their performance appraisals were actually measuring this data against um, what they scored within their psychometric assessments previously um, and matching that data alongside. So that, that's a big reason that we've, we've kept it on and have seen it working. Okay, all right. Um, gosh, the, the questions are just keep on flowing. We've got about, um, I'm not sure, we've got still quite a few to go. So we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going for a few more minutes and then what we'll have to do is get back to, um, to those where we haven't been able to. Yeah. Um, do HR departments people that show strengths in some but not all of the tests, e.g. high on cognitive, low on EQ, or high on both, or does it depend? I've heard firms pick people with different strengths and weaknesses. If so, is it worth determining your own strengths and weaknesses? Um, I'm not sure, I guess, how you would 
determine or outline your strengths and weaknesses. I guess there's no waiting between other. And I, I guess we don't, I guess, have preferences as to either. Again, it's more of a holistic thing. Um, it might be a thing uh, that, that some firms, if you maybe were to score higher on cognitive, but maybe lower on EQ, they might concentrate on those sorts of things in interviews. Um, but mm. I, I haven't seen it where a firm or, or anybody has been looking for say X amount of people that have high cognitive ability and sort of balancing that out with um, people that yeah. might have high EQ. Um, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, how do you use comprehensive feedback from tests when you don't progress at that stage to help you improve in future tests? Um, do you give, do you give people feedback on their results? Yeah, we do. So once you finalise or once you finish the test, you'll actually receive an email from Revelion um, basically outlining what your strengths and, and weaknesses are um, and areas for improvement. So it will give you some tips within those emails about um, things to look at to, to oh. help you improve. All right. Um, what, is your eyes, what is your eyesight difficulties? Okay, so what happens if you've got eyesight difficulties? Yeah, of course. Again, um, definitely flag it with us as soon as you can within your application um, so we can alter um, or, or um, yeah, help modify to, to get you the best experience from the, the application phase as well. Um, this would be something we'd look at, um, again, with Rebellion, maybe looking at altering the test for you or if there's a way we can manipulate it um, to best serve the needs of, of whatever the condition is. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're, so we've answered that one about the test, how long it is. Um, do you think there is a cultural impact? So I'm assuming, does that mean, do the tests take into account the, the cultural differences? Um, cultural differences, probably not so much. I don't think any of the tests would. I mean, Cognify, especially not in emotional intelligence. Um, potentially that might be a factor within the values that people may have. Um, but yeah, definitely a good question. And I'd, I'd love to ask Revelion that one to see, mm. I guess, what sort of, um, impacts it might have, if any. Um, so yeah, happy to get back to that one, actually. That's a good question. Okay. Um, do the criteria depend on which area of law, as in Clark supplying for financial law stream, may be assessed differently to Clark supplying for M&A? No. So all Clarks are, are tested the same. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, the links, I will make sure the links are sent through. All right. This is another great question. Has the recruitment process changed since COVID-19? <laughs> Great question. Um, at this stage, no, it's probably um, slightly too early to, I guess, have changed everything completely. Um, definitely something we're looking at at this stage. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess I can't really tell you what was to change because nothing has changed essentially as yet. Um, what we will probably look at doing if the current situation is still happening um, is doing video interviews and things like that. Um, in terms of the psychometric testing, that won't change whatsoever because it's an online platform anyway. Um, but yeah, other aspects might change, but we'll definitely let people know as, as soon as that happens. Okay. Um, sorry, you're going through like a marathon here, Trent. Oh, it's good. I love it. <laughs> Questions are really fantastic. Um, this question is around whether older or more, more mature applicants, oh, I don't like that, older, um, are disadvantaged by the gaming format. Um, slightly, yeah. And that's why I, I sort of stress the fact that if you're not familiar with doing these sorts of game-based things, that it's very important to to use the links that both Susan and I provided to um, upskill yourself or, or practice these types of tests just to get yourself familiar with these things as well. Um, so I guess there would be a disadvantage, I guess, with anybody that hasn't used these sorts of games before. So that's the idea behind the tutorials, um, to get everybody on a level playing field as to yeah, what, what you're about to undertake. Yeah, and I mean, and different firms um, are using different tests as well. So not, not everyone um, is using Revelion, I'd imagine. There's a, there's a few other different ones too, like the Savile Holdsworth and, and Corn Ferry, where I think they're, they're more traditional format. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have advice about whether law firms and departments value your collaborative networking and interpersonal skills versus um, meeting client expectations. 
I think they value all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone has different skills and strengths and weaknesses and things like that. Um, and I think that's also important with the psychometric testing to realise that it, um, it's not just about the psychometric testing. And that's why I'm saying that it, that's not necessarily an absolute cutoff point. Um, and it's also the reason that we test different things as well within the psychometric testing. So we're not just testing your aptitude. Um, we're also testing other things like emotional intelligence and your, your interpersonal skills um, within a team. Um, so, yeah. Yep. And I think that answers the next question too about the key attributes that Ashurst value. Um, so, yeah, we've talked about that you know, things like global experience, languages, overseas experience, innovation, leadership. Yep, absolutely spot on. That mm. would, I'd imagine would be all highly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely about diversity in, in yourself and, and sort of bringing you across as a very diverse person and a holistic person as well. So, yeah, yeah. very. Um, are you good, good to keep going, Trent? How are you? it's twenty five two. It looks like there's still a few more questions. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, some of them might 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 be simpler ones. Like, yeah, no worries. Does Ashurst London office use the same graduate recruitment process? Um, I believe they do not. I will get back to that as well. I think theirs is slightly different as well, um, and they don't actually use the same provider as we do. I think it's different. So I'll I'll confirm that as well, along with the Hong Kong one. All right. And in terms of application portals open, I'm assuming that might be for the, the clerkship um, or it might be for the, the traineeship programs. Is that? Uh, yeah. So the clerkship ones, um, we're a signatory of the LIV guidelines. So they'll be able to outline the dates for you. Um, it's later in the year in um, July. Uh, so just have a look at the dates on the LIV website. And then mm -hmm. for the, the graduate applications, they feed off our clerkship applications. So Yep. yep. Okay. All right. What kind of measures have been taken to ensure there is no unconscious um, AI discrimi discrimination on rebellion? Good question. Um, that's probably a question that I will have to ask Rebellion because it's it's probably more to do with the intricacies and the, the psychology behind the actual systems rather than the, the testing itself. Okay. And I think there's just two more questions. Um, in relation to COVID, do you think firms will reduce their number of clerks taken on this year? Um, good question. I think it's a very topical one at the moment as well. Um, it's it's really hard to say. Um, I would say that just because of COVID-19, it doesn't necessarily mean that, I guess, speaking upon all firms or, or any organisation in general that work um, hasn't picked up from other factors. Um, so yeah, I think it's wait and see at this stage. Um, we'll see how long this lasts um, as to, to try and make a call on that. But I, I honestly don't know. And I, I don't think um, anybody could, could decide right now as to whether that may be a factor or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably good for people to kind of look a bit laterally as well and, and keep options open. Um, the last question, and you've answered 33, so... Go you. Um, oh, actually, the last two. Regarding mature age, do you think that years of exercise make a difference to minutes or hours? Maybe years of experience make a difference to minutes or hours? Um, um, in terms of how long it would take you? I, I'm um, thinking that's what they might mean, yeah. Maybe it's um, if you're not used to that gaming, maybe it just might take longer then well, maybe yeah i guess it should take everybody about the same amount of time because all the games have the same time limits in terms of the cognitive and emotional intelligence um the only reason that it would go i guess over time if you were spending more time on doing the values um but that the first two should take everybody the same amount of time okay um are there any psychometric testing platforms that we can use to see where our abilities fall um yes i mean I'll send those to you. You can also pay to, to do some too and to get a report. Um, but I would probably suggest that you do the practice test before you, um, you go in and, and pay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, I think that has brought us to an end. One more last question. Just to confirm, do you have to complete a clerkship with Ashurst before you can get a graduate role? Uh, yes, you do traditionally, yeah. Yeah, you don't go tend to go to the market. 
no, not generally. We do, we do um, go to the market after we make um, graduate offers to the, the previous clerks. So um, the offers that we make um, this August, we may, depending on numbers, um, go out to the market, when, which is when people are obviously welcome to apply. Um, so definitely encourage you to do that then if, if that was to happen. Right. Okay. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Trent, for really, really enlightening us and taking through all those tests, um, assessments. It's just been fantastic and so valuable to, to everyone that would have um, participated. So no problem. Really, I really, really appreciate it hearing it straight from you. No um, worries. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I hope, I hope everyone got a lot from it. Um, and if there's anything that I can answer, obviously I'll, I'll take those few questions away and, and Susan and I will answer the ones that we, we haven't in the Q&A. Um, but if there's anything after, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for listening. And as I said, um, you will be sent the, the link to the recording of this session and the PowerPoint um, presentations as well, which includes the, the links to some of the practice tests. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Take care.